um, after we had the, the women of Vatican II. I think you have to start your video. Again. Got it. Okay. Um, after I gave a talk on the women at Vatican II in February, Deb suggested the possibility of having a four part series on the council. And I was delighted with that opportunity. And so um, my, my, the first talk is this evening and I have entitled it Vatican II, Achievements and a Work in Progress. Um, I'm truly honored to have this opportunity um, because I'm speaking on a topic that is and has been for a very long time, the center of my theological research. Before I go on, I need to make um, one clarification. And I usually like to do this um, when I give a talk on, on Vatican II. And that is, I never want my audience to think that I'm of the mind that everything that preceded Vatican II somehow was bad or unacceptable or desperately in need of change uh, 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 and that everything after Vatican II was just perfect because that is not the case. Um, the church before Vatican II produced many saints. Um, it produced John the 23rd and it produced many of us. Um, and it also, it, it met the needs at a particular time in the church. And so it was a model of church that worked at that time. It no longer works for the current church. And John the 23rd had the vision and to see that, which is why he surprised the world and convened a second um, ecumenical council, which we are discussing this evening. But I just want my audiences always to know it's not a black and white, one was bad, one was good, um, but we desperately needed a change and John gave it to us. So we can begin. When I was teaching undergraduates at St. Anselm College, I would always tell them that there are some moments in human history that should never be forgotten. Some of these moments are horrific. The Holocaust is one such example. And even though it conjures up such painful memories, we must never forget that moment in human history. At the other end of the spectrum, Vatican II is another moment that deserves to be remembered, especially in Roman Catholic church history. We must not forget this moment because it truly was a watershed moment for the modern church and for the world. In this evening's talk, I plan to offer an overview of the council, which I hope will set the stage for the remaining talks in the series. In the remaining three presentations, I plan to focus on three themes. We will examine how, as a result of Vatican II, first, the church looks at the world now. Secondly, how the church looks at the laity. Thirdly, how the church looks at itself. As you know, next year marks the 60th anniversary of the opening of Vatican II. And this council has rightly been described as the most important religious event of the 20th century. Over three years from 1962 to 65, some 2,800 bishops from 116 countries produced 16 documents that set the course for the future of the Roman Catholic Church. Throughout the series of talks, one thing will be in the back of my mind, and I hope it will be in your minds as well. We continue to talk about Vatican II even today because of its significant to the its significance to the life of the church. But it will only continue to be significant if we give serious reflection to the challenge of the council for our time. In one way or another, each and every one of us has been touched by this council. We do right to remember Vatican II because in the remembering and in the retelling, we access, we access once again, I hope, the profound power of that moment. 
In order to put the council in context, let me begin with an overview, a brief overview of the prevailing mindset just prior to the council. Most Catholics in the United States received their religious instruction from the Baltimore Catechism, first published in 1884 and used extensively from 1910 all the way up to 1963. In and of itself, the Catechism was a good thing, but there were some problems. For one thing, it was in question and answer format. And many Catholics came to believe that if they memorized all the answers to the catechism questions, that made them good Catholics. Of course, that is not true. I could study all the teachings of the Mormon church and memorize the answers. That would not necessarily make me a good Mormon. It would make me a person who knows what Mormons believe. So the catechism's emphasis on intellectual knowledge of the faith often neglected the need for that knowledge to touch the heart and the soul of the believer. Another drawback was that it was marred by an air of defensiveness. The defensive stance of the catechism reflects something of the theological and pastoral climate in the pre-Vatican II church. It was a church concerned with maintaining internal unity and external ex, uh, conformity, while casting a suspicious and sometimes hostile glance toward those outside the faith. To disagree with the church was to disagree with God. To leave the church was to abandon God. As time passes, however, it becomes harder and harder to convey the incredible significance of the impact of Vatican II. Because the pre-Vatican II way of life and thinking in many ways no longer exists. Except perhaps those of the minds, in the minds of those who are old enough to have lived in both churches. For post-Vatican II generations, this former view is simply unknown. On December 17, 1965, just days after the council ended, Time Magazine printed uh, an insightful article entitled, How Vatican II Turned the Church Toward the World. It quoted two men who were very close to the council's activities. With regard to the church before Vatican II, the English Benedictine abbot, Christopher Butler, claimed, quote, before Vatican II, the church looked like an immense, immovable colossus, the city on a hill, the stable bulwark against revolutionary change, end quote. Then, Commenting on the enormous change brought about by Vatican II, India's Archbishop Eugene D'Souza remarked, quote, the church's whole approach to the world is now one of sincere admiration, not of dominating it, but of serving it, not of despising it, but of appreciating it, not of condemning it, but of strengthening it and serving it. So despite a history of mistrust, disdain, and often outright condemnation, the church had reconciled with the world. Such a moment was the result of many factors, some of which will, some of which will be covered in next week's lecture on the church and the world. For now, we look at the opening of John's Council. On October 11th, 1962, John's Council opened. With 2,540 participants at the opening session, it became the largest gathering in any council in church history. And in his remarkable opening address, John XXIII offered to the world 
what he hoped his council would achieve. Quote, the Christian and Catholic spirit throughout the world is expecting a leap forward toward a doctrinal penetration and a forming of conscious consciences in accordance with authentic doctrine. This examination of doctrine should be studied and explained following the methods of research and presentation used by modern thought because the substance of the deposit of faith is one thing and the way it is articulated in every age is another, end quote. An entire lecture could be devoted to unpacking just that one quote of John's opening address. He was sending out an important signal to those theologians who had been working so hard in the decades leading up to the council. Theologians who in many cases had been disciplined harshly by Vatican authorities for their modern theological ideas. And here was John the 23rd basically acknowledging the legitimacy of their approach to theology. John even went so far as to invite some of these theologians as to serve as pariti or theological experts to the fathers at Vatican II. The last sentence in the opening quote that I read to you is the most often quoted line of John the 23rd. The ancient deposit of the faith is one thing. The way it is articulated in every age is another. We will revisit that concept as the weeks go by. John wanted this to be a pastoral council, meaning this. A pastoral approach is not without doctrine. It is doctrinal, but in a way that is not satisfied with merely passing on concepts and definitions. Rather, it intends to present the truths of salvation in a way which is close to contemporary men and women, a way which accepts their questions and their difficulties and tries to answer them. And this is precisely what Vatican II achieved. That is why we must never forget the gift that John the 23rd was or the gift that he gave to the church, the Second Vatican Council. However, looking back over the years, I find myself asking, have we lost the momentum? I fear that many in the church have either forgotten this remarkable moment in our history, or worse, simply don't know about it. How could this be? So much has been written on this council. It has been called the most decisive event in modern church history. It was a moment of grace in the life of the church for so many reasons. In my February talk about the women at Vatican II, I listed some of those reasons. I would like to share a few of them again because I believe they contribute to the overall look at the Second Vatican Council. Instead of continuing a hostile and suspicious attitude toward the world, Vatican II acknowledged the inherent goodness of the world, seeing it as the creation of God. Instead of regarding itself as spotless and all holy, the church acknowledged its own errors, failings, sins, and expressed the need for the church to continually reform itself. Instead of viewing the church primarily as a pyramid with the Pope at the top followed by hierarchy, clergy, religious, and then at the very bottom, the laity. The church reclaimed the New Testament vision of church, a communion vision with no one better than any other simply by virtue of one's vocation. You may recall some of you, the catechism page 
that had two photos on one page side by side. On the left was the picture of a bride and groom on their wedding day. And above it was written, this is good. Right next to that picture is a photo of a vowed religious woman in full pre-Vatican II habit, um, kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament praying. And above that picture is written, this is better. Instead, the council spoke of the one universal vocation, the call to holiness by virtue of our baptism. And it embraced the New Testament's understanding of the diversity of gifts, of charisms in the body of Christ. Also, instead of focusing our attention on the next world, always preparing our souls for the next world, and not realizing how significant or important our activity was in this world, Vatican II drew our attention to the need to transform this world. Instead of viewing other churches with hostility and other religions as false and harmful, the council called us to respect our brothers and sisters. And perhaps in one of its greatest achievements, at least in my opinion, Vatican II acknowledged that salvation is a gift that can be offered to all of humanity, not just Roman Catholics. Despite these remarkable theological developments, here we are almost 60 years later with so much yet to be implemented. Why is that? In fairness, some of this is to be expected. As the great Cardinal John Henry Newman, who attended the first Vatican Council in 1869, once wrote, quote, it is rare for a council not to be followed by confusion, end quote. And it should be noted that Vatican II was followed by extensive and radical socio-cultural change. For those of us old enough to remember the 60s, we recall a time of overall protest and disenchantment with authority on all levels. The church would not be immune to this disenchantment. Still, we need to ask some questions. Have we lost the momentum? Have we forgotten what it was like to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in such an important way? How could it be that the, the, that the developments I alluded to earlier, which are clearly found in the council documents and therefore are the official church teachings, how is it that they have failed to be sufficiently implemented? As we know, in some circles, these changes have been vehemently resisted. What do we do now? How do we genuinely remember that moment of grace in our church and bring it to fruition? How do we not give in to the frustration? How do we stay faithful and not walk away from the tradition into which we were born? The tradition that gives us life the tradition that sustains us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. For one thing, we give thanks for organizations such as Future Church that is sponsoring this series of talks. And based on what Deb said at the beginning, take seriously our need to participate in writing letters or do whatever we need to do to let our bishops know um, and have our voices heard on the agenda for the new synod. We also need to give thanks for those of you who are here tonight, who choose to participate in this series. You do give me hope. We also remember that the Christian God is a God of promise. This past weekend, I gave a presentation to the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet. And I realized that there was some overlap with what I planned to say to you this evening. That talk was based on a quote 
taken from the book of Esther in the Old Testament. Esther's people were about to be victims of genocide, and she is persuaded by her uncle to make a courageous move to save them, telling her, quote, remember who you are. Perhaps it was for this very moment that you were created, end quote. So if we are discouraged that we have not sufficiently implemented the teachings of Vatican II, maybe this quote can serve us well. The fact that our God is revealed as a God of promise is central to biblical hope. We have been given something to hope for. And biblical hope is grounded in this fact. God always keeps God's promises. Psalm 89, I will not violate my covenant. I, the promise of my lips I will not alter. Isaiah 46, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am your God. I have made you. I will carry you. I will sustain you. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. As a result of Vatican II, we no longer read the Bible literally, but these words must mean something. Perhaps this is the moment for which we were created, to advance the rebirth of the church in the new millennium in the spirit and the teachings of Vatican II. As we reflect on the meaning of Vatican II for our time, I think it important to keep in mind the immediate impact of the council in 1965, especially as we try to uncover reasons for the, the lack of sufficient implementation. One observer at the council, theologian Gregory Baum, has suggested that we should frequently read John the 23rd's opening speech. He, he advises that because in that speech, John proclaimed that the church, almost 2,000 years old at that time, was ever new, ever young, and ever capable in the Holy Spirit of being reborn and renewed. John disagreed with the prophets of doom, some of them in his own curia, who, inspired by fear, resisted his call for renewal and reform. Sadly, this resistance continues even today. But John refused to give in to that resistance. His opening speech contained the following message as well. In the present order of things, divine providence is leading us to a new order of human relations which by humanity's own efforts and even beyond its expectations are directed toward the fulfillment of God's superior and inscrutable designs." End quote. Some years after the council, Cardinal Walter Casper, who was also at Vatican II, said, quote, I, I myself have no doubt that the council's finest hour is still to come, that its seed will spring up and bear fruit. For John the 23rd, the outside world was not a wilderness of falsehood fraught with danger. Rather, it was the theater on which God was unfolding the great drama of salvation. I propose to you this evening that it is currently our time to, say, to take center stage in this drama. It is our time to retell this story. It is our time to rekindle the fire. Let me offer just some closing reflections. One of the observers at Vatican II was asked, who do you think was the most significant figure at Vatican II? 
He responded, I know that most people would probably say Pope John the 23rd or Pope Paul the 6th. For me, however, it was the Holy Spirit whose presence was almost palpable. We need to feel that presence of the Spirit. We have yet to implement the charter written at Vatican II that restored the church as the people of God. That charter was intended to make the church more humble, more at the service of the world, more decentralized. And almost to assure us at the last conclave, the Holy Spirit gave us a Pope who is a champion of the kind of church John and Vatican II envisioned. One of the theologians who assisted the bishops at Vatican II, another great Dominican, I have to put in a plug for the Dominican family, Eve Congar, was truly a man of vision. He maintained that genuine reform would be recognized by an openness to adapt the structures of church life to new situations. Let me just offer you an example off the top of my head. The new, we have a new situation in, let's just say the American church right now. We have a serious shortage of priestly vocations. And so therefore, rather than do something about it, we've simply merged parish after parish after parish after parish and as we know, liturgy is meant to be more intimate and small and communion pop, uh, friendly. So we have a new situation and the structure of ordination as we know it today is a human structure. It was created by the humans who followed the risen Christ, the ascended Christ. So that's a human structure and could be changed. And so Kongar was saying, genuine reform will be recognized when and by an openness to adapt the structures of the church to new situations, to refuse to let any stage in the life of the church be considered definitive, meaning no change, finished, done. No, refuse to let that happen is what Kongar is saying, claiming that along the journey, the ecclesiastical apparatus must never be permitted to obscure God's grace. Now that's kind of a wordy sentence, but it's really important. What Kongar is saying is at no point in the history of the church must those running the church, that is the ecclesiastical apparatus, because you and I, unless there's a priest amongst us, you and I are not running the church. But Kongar was saying at no time should we allow the ecclesiastical apparatus, all right, to obscure God's grace. This is a, Kongar said this maybe 40 years ago, 50 years ago. It was a few years after the council. He could have been describing Pope Francis with these words. In his apostolic exhortation, The Joy of the Gospel, Pope Francis said the following. See if you see Congar's method, Congar's message in this quote from Pope Francis. We seek to abandon the complacent attitude that says, we have always done it this way. I invite everyone to be bold and creative in this task of rethinking the structures, the styles, and the methods of evangelization in their respective communities, end quote. This is precisely what Congar was calling for. And this is how we would recognize genuine reform in the church when we refuse to let any stage of the, in the life of the church be considered definitive, that no more growth would be necessary. This is fine as is. And like John the 23rd, resisting the prophets of doom at the council, 
Pope Francis does as well. It's no secret that he, he, Francis receives many criticisms, even from his brother bishops, which I think is, is, is truly sad, very sad. But in an address given not too long ago to the Curia, well known for their resistance, Francis quoted a 19th century composer, Gustav Mahler, saying, tradition is not the worship of ashes, it is the preservation of the fire. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, it is the preservation of the fire. Those theologians working in the decades before Vatican II, who were paving the way for the council's extraordinary de developments would have loved that quote by Pope Francis. So you see, the council is not over. It isn't a then, it's a now. We must remember that we are a church. We are a church which has always found a way to reform. Vatican II showed us the way. One of my favorite quotes from one of the Vatican II documents is this. The future of humanity is in the hands of those who are strong enough to give future generations reasons for living and hoping. We are the people of God. We have a voice. Do we dare not tell this story to a new generation? Thank you. I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. For questions. So uh, I'm going to open it up for questions. So if you have a question, you can either raise your hand uh, with the little system for raising hands, or you can unmute yourself. And so you come to the top of my list, uh, and then I will call on you. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Maureen, as people are getting ready to ask their questions, um, I have heard it said that part of the reason uh, that Vatican II were not more developed in the way the church, a Vatican II church, is because uh, some people felt that there wasn't enough room given to uh, those who are more traditional, who were nervous about the changes. And then others say, we should have just blotted it out, you know, been much more, sh much stronger about, <laughs> about bringing it forward. Do you have any, like, <clears throat> opinion on that at all? I'm not sure I understand the question, Deb. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Um, oh, you are. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's better. Um, okay. Are you saying that we sort of gave in to the more traditional voices at the council and let them have their, and we, and, and as a result of that, we didn't do more or, or, and that we should have just plowed over them and just let the majority have their way? I've heard it said, I, I've heard it said both ways. So, you know, that either we should have allowed for those traditionalists to have more space or vice versa that we should have. Uh, so I don't know, it, it was like a new insight, a new thought to me. So I just wondered if you'd ever heard that or if you thought that was one of the reasons why, if you, I guess maybe my bottom line question is, why haven't we developed more? Who held us back is really- Oh, okay. Real you mean at the council or since the council? Since the council. Okay, because it sounded like your question was intended for at the council because- No. When the bishops arrived in Rome for the beginning of the council, they were met with 70 schemas, basically position papers that were written by the traditionalists who really basically controlled the curia before Vatican II. Mm -hmm. And within the first, I don't know, week or two, those 70 schemas were simply rejected. Mm -hmm. And they started from scratch because, and I believe firmly that the Holy Spirit all right, um, I used to tell my students, here's how I explain the 16 documents. The Holy Spirit came, drugged all the bishops at Vatican II, then went on to write the 16 documents, woke them up and said, sign this, go home. That is the only way. You know, when Congar first heard that John the 23rd was calling a council, council, he said, if this is by the Holy Spirit, if this is not by the Holy Spirit, this is going to be a catastrophe. 
However, if it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, it will be, and I don't know what his exact word was, but it will be magnificent. And of course it was by the Holy Spirit. John himself acknowledged that he was inspired, you know, to, to call to convene this council. Um, so at the council, I would say the majority, I don't want to say they won, but they held sway. They got much of what they wanted in the council documents, but we also have to honestly say, if you read the council documents carefully, yes. they are compromised documents. Yeah. Because yeah. both sides got their goodies in. Both right. sides, you know, it was almost like, I'll give you this if you give me that, yeah. you know, writing a treaty. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. Because now when we quote why the church should be A or B, the progressives quote the majority, which were the progressives, and the conservatives quote their people who, mm -hmm. who managed to get their little pieces in. And so we're at a, a stalemate almost. That is why I, that's why I mentioned the term, the rebirth of the church of the new millennium, because mm -hmm. I think we have to once and for all make a stand, take a stand. Yeah. The, what the majority were trying to do was to bring the church back to its New Testament roots. That's what it was trying to do. And its language is clearly does that. Mm -hmm. All right. But and many of the bishops that were at the council were changed. In, I mean, really, they were converted mm -hmm. at the council. Now, they were there for four, well, four years, four sessions over four years. But when they came back to their parishes and their dioceses, those people did not know what they were talking about. And so it was very hard for them to implement. I mean, I'm actually feeling sorry for some of the bishops who had to get all their people on board because they weren't there for that fiery experience. Mm -hmm. You know, when you build something, you know, mm -hmm. it, it becomes yours, you own it. Now he was simply, you know, the bishop is imposing it on his diocese. And unless he's a good teacher, mm -hmm. it was hard to get them. So mm -hmm. my feeling has been the better, so much of the implementation of Vatican II depended upon A, the bishop who informed the diocese, and B, was he of a majority mindset or minority, and C, was he, a, was he good at teaching? Mm -hmm. Because we could be of one persuasion or another and be a terrible teacher yeah. and never get our point across. So, um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing today, we're seeing a new kind of priesthood, in one sense, emerging, is what I'm being told, um, that are, are, they're coveting the good old days and want to return to the pre-Vatican II understanding of church. And I find that troubling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is a fact of life. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's move to either Kathy or Ed Hart. You have a question? Uh, yes, uh, we have a, a question. Um, when you are teaching, uh, Sister, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for, for the presentation. But in, in teaching uh, on the college level uh, to students who have not are too young to remember Vatican II. Maybe their parents told them about it. Uh, their world today is different than it was during the days of Vatican II even. Mm -hmm. So uh, how is it that you, uh, how is it that they bring to you questions that Vatican II can relate to? And how can you make that, um, um, the, the questions that, gra that, that, that were uh, grappled with at Vatican II pertinent to today's questions. You know what, um, when I first saw the quote from Francis, you know, tradition is not about the preservation of the worship of the ashes, but the preservation of the fire. What, what I've tried to do in my classes is to bring the essence of Vatican II and and since the essence of Vatican II is the New Testament, 
all right? The New Testament never goes out of style. So there is a way to apply the New Testament teaching to any given contemporary situation. Um, I thought you were going to say something else. The, um, what I found maddening when I was teaching undergraduates is that even those who had just come from 12 years of Catholic um, elementary school, when I would say Vatican II, I might as well have been talking about World War II. It was something they heard about, but did not have any idea what it was. So what I had to do in my classes was basically do what I did tonight. Start with, here's what the church looked like before Vatican II. Here's what Vatican II tried to change. And here's how we can apply some of those changes to the church of today. For example, one of the Vatican II documents is on social communication. Well, I wouldn't dare have a contemporary student read that document because we didn't even have the internet then. You know, so there's no way that that document is pertinent today, unfortunately. I mean, there are some principles in it that are good, but in terms of communicating, we did not have, you know, Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, and things like that. And so it's up to us to find ways to apply the essence of Vatican II teachings to today's experience. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that was my stab at it. Oh, very good. Thank you. Thank okay, you very great. much. Thank you so much. So Marie Positano, I hope I didn't butcher your name too much. You'll have to unmute yourself. Marie. Yes. Thank you very much, Deborah. Uh, Sister Maureen, uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm an Amityville Dominican associate and I'm proud that you're part of our family. Um, my concern is, as yours is, I find it quite troubling that the young priests are being trained in the seminaries pre-Vatican II. And the priests that are coming out, they're more interested in the fancy brocade of the chasubles and, you know, incense and, you know, serving the mass with the back to the people. Isn't there anything that Pope Francis can do? I mean, I know he's not interested in, you know, keeping things the way they were. He wants to change the courier. But I mean, could he issue any kind of, I don't know, ruling that seminaries need to uh, follow a certain uh, course of study that, you know, doesn't ignore that we had a pre-Vatican life? but doesn't make it be the sum and substance of what is taught? Well, what, uh, that's an excellent question. What I think Francis has tried to do, and remember, there is no organization that moves more slowly, I don't think, than the church. Oh, sure. And I mean that sincerely. And we're talking a billion Catholics worldwide. And you're talking the church in Nigeria, the church in China, the church in America, the church all over. And so he, he oversees Catholics from all over the world. And he's one man, what is he, 84? Is he 84 years old now, I think? I think. Um, or am I adding years to him? I'm not sure. But um, I hope he lives a very long time. Uh, Please, God. And he has made efforts to curtail certain expressions of pre-Vatican II liturgical celebration. For example, Benedict XVI issued a document which made the um, celebration of the Tridentine Mass far more frequent. Um, and one of the things that Francis has done is to, I, I don't want to use the word limit that, but for example, one of the things that was part and parcel of the pre-Vatican II church was private masses where a priest would go to an altar and if an altar boy was available, wonderful, but he would have, and if not, he would simply go through the ritual of the mass. No people were there. He would simply stand at the altar and celebrate the Eucharist and had his own private mass. Pope Francis has forbidden 
these private masses in the private chapels on the sides of St. Peter's Basilica. So he is trying to um, bring forward um, the, the Vatican II image of church while at the same time trying to eradicate some of the pre-Vatican II elements of the church. Um, but it does take time. Most of the members of the Curia are like 150, and they've been in those positions for many, many, many years. One of the other things Francis is doing is that he is um, removing some of these cardinals from their Curia positions. The ink isn't even dry on their, you know, they must res uh, resign, hand in their resignation when they turn 75. Um, but in some cases, the Pope doesn't immediately accept their resignation. Maybe they're doing a wonderful job. They're needed in a diocese, et cetera, whatever. Um, there are some cardinals, though, the ink isn't even dry on the resignation letter when Pope Francis accepts it and demotes them. He did that with Cardinal Raymond Burke from his very, very important position in the Curia to, I think he's, I don't know, overseas the Diocese of Malta or something which I don't even know where that is. But so he, little by little, he is making the effort, but it takes time. Could he make a rule? Yes. Is it his style? I don't think so. I just don't think that's Pope Francis's style. He's more by persuasion, by lived example, you know, this is the man who on the first Holy Thursday, I believe, was at the prison washing the feet of um, the, uh, the prisoners. This is a man who told the recent group of new cardinals um, they must not throw lavish, lavish, and I do mean lavish, parties on the day that they are made cardinals. He is the, the one who has told cardinals that something about he put a limit on how much money they can have as a personal asset because some of these cardinals are extremely rich so trust me when i tell you francis is making an effort to bring the church to the vatican to vision but it's not an easy task not at all Thank you. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sister Marie. Uh, Joe, you have a question? Um, I do. It's, um, it is more of a comment than a question, but uh, for me, the pandemic has shown the, the, a very negative aspect of the church regarding clericalism and sexism. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were watching our Zoom masses, we just saw the priest. Mm -hmm. Nobody else but the priest. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the way women are being treated just during this time, it, it, I just found it very painful. I agree with you. Know, you. I agree. I with would, you. if I did watch something on Zoom, I would recommend St. Francis Xavier in Manhattan. <laughs> um, okay. After the prayers of the faithful, I would turn it off. Mm -hmm. You know, I would go up to the homily, prayers of the faithful, and mm -hmm. turn it off. Um, in, for me, it's in regards what Maureen said this is what we have to change. Yeah. And it was, it was blatant during the pandemic. It was Thank because you. they were the only ones who could exercise the liturgy. Yeah, exactly. And so once again, they had the power and they used it with full, you know, you know, with, with full power. And, um, you know, there's a church, I thought you were going to you might mention there's a church in Rome, and I think it is St. Francis Xavier, but it's it's run by the Jesuits. Um, this uh, one is too. Oh, okay. Yeah. The Jesuits in um, 
in Rome, but um, when, when you're in Rome, all the it, a, a lot of Americans who live in Rome go to this church, and it's because it is a Vatican II church. And I would love to have known how they celebrated or what they were doing during the pandemic, because when I was there, I would go to their church every Sunday, and um, it was, you know, the church was in the round. We all seated, seated, seated uh, in a circle. A woman was a preacher. There was no question. Here we are within walking distance to the Vatican, and they had no qualms about having female preachers. Um, and and yet, you know, uh, and as you know, as happy as I am about this whole um, Francis making it official that. The, there is an apostolate of the catechist. Um, we've been doing this for a long, long time. I, and I do see there is a value in making it an official apostolate because there are some thick skulls that are out there that have to have something official done in order for them to allow something to occur. But um, I, the role of women in the church um, it is so troubling to me. Um, you know, I know in my lifetime, I'm not going to see, I don't think I'll see major changes, um, but we should. There, there's a, a priest friend of mine who always quotes a fellow Jesuit who says, if you're not going to ordain them, don't baptize them. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. And it's true, there is absolutely... Um, and I have and I have done research on this, and you know I don't want to I don't want to devolve into an, a discussion of female ordination, but I will just say that um, there is I have done research on this, and I have asked the the most brilliant minds that I respect, theological minds. There is no prohibition in Scripture against the ordination of women, so there is no theological barrier. There is only a social barrier and it's not and they're not going to let go of that barrier uh, or of the reins of that control it very easily you know it's just they want to hold on to it and it's unfortunate because I do think um, you know when I was down at Joe's um, Center for Spirituality in Rock Hill South Carolina um, it reminded me of the days when I was studying at Fordham I would have dinner with uh, frequently as a guest of the Jesuits. And it was so wonderful to sit with the Jesuits and have them treat me like one of their own. I wasn't a student then. I mean, I was a student, but I, they didn't treat me as a student. It was, I was another budding theologian and um, we laughed, we talked, we shared. And when I was down in South Carolina, I was living at the monastery and shared, had my meals with um, the uh, the other um, brothers at and, and priests at um, Rock Hill, and we had a grand old time. It was like being, you know, with colleagues, and that's what we, you know, I felt like I was received well and accepted well at at Rock Hill, um, and that's what we could be doing with our our priests, but. There's no getting a foot in that door anytime in the near future. But Joe makes a really good point about liturgy during the pandemic. That was an eye opener. It really was an eye opener. I'm watching um, the time, yeah. Um, yeah. Deb, and I hope I didn't go over. I actually tried to stay within about a 30 minute. Um, I was just gonna suggest, uh, it is getting late. I was gonna take one more uh, question and then we're going to call it quits for tonight and we can ask everyone else to bring your questions next time. So Absolutely. So you think, could email me. Yes. Okay. And Mary and him, Mary and his bell has the, uh, let's have, let her have the last question and then we'll, we'll close her out. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, mine is first of all, Maureen, I really, really appreciated what you're doing here. I signed in mainly be hoping that I could use this, if it's recorded, with my own students in the fall. Um, I teach Vatican II. I love Vatican II. I grew up in high school. Uh, my religion class in senior year was reading Gaudium et Spes in the form of, of a 
schema 13 or one of those things. Mm -hmm. So th I was, was, yeah. So anyway, I, I've, I've just always, you know, just had such an exciting, and I teach Vatican too, too, like you, and I, I've known, you, known your work. But I think for me, it's kind of like what Ed Hart started out saying is like the concern about the, you know, young people who are spiritual and not religious and not invent, not invested in institutions. How can we, I'm not really asking this as a question. I'm sort of giving it out as a challenge. Mm -hmm. I think everyone who has shown up here today, even if you have uh, like, I just want to know what is Vatican II, I don't know too much. I wish we could find some channels with nieces, nephews, children, people who are under, who are under 40 um, of ways of communicating with them about what that important event, the most important religious event of the 20th century, as you mm -hmm. called it, really is all about. And so um, I'm very concerned about the synod, the synodality idea of Francis. I love it. But of course, it's going to start with the Episcopal conferences. And mm -hmm. in our situation in the United States, that is not the greatest place to start. No. Um, there are great bishops like Tobin and Supich and, right. and um, I can't think of his name, the guy from the uh, Los Angeles, the McElroy. McElroy. Now it's in San Diego. Yeah. So there's these few prophetic people. But I just wish, and I know not all of us are teachers, but maybe some of us, at least we all talk to younger people. Yeah. Um, well, we're all involved in some way in, in our care for the church. Exactly. So I just want to throw that out. Uh, and thank you so much because I found this really inspiring. I mean, I've studied Vatican II forever. But it's always good to get revived. And thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely, yeah. And Marianne, I'm so delighted to hear that you're teaching a course on um, on Vatican II because um, I found, I, I would like to recommend to you, and maybe we'll do it at the last session if, um, or one of the sessions that we have, if I can, I, I hate to take, it's only four or five minutes long. So maybe I will arrange with Deb to play it next week because it, Gaudium et Spes is the document we'll be looking at next week for the church in the world. But one of my students, Marianne, I suggest you take a look at YouTube and look under Vatican II Project. And um, you know, look up Vatican II Project. The girl who put it together was Kristen Raymond. Mm -hmm. And she took the song, I Will Fix You by Coldplay, which I did not know. I didn't even know the name of the group. At least I know Coldplay. Okay, I didn't even know them. <laughs> but um, the song, she took it and she used the song in the background and then she used images and she used words from our textbook and from the Vatican II documents scrolling down below while in the background, I Will Fix You is playing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, in my students were able to either do a final project, a written project, or a spoken. They could do whatever medium they wanted. And um, she chose to make a video. I think it's five minutes long. I, she asked if she could show it to the class. And I said, of course, we would love to see it before she handed it in. And so we turned out the lights. We put on the video. I was actually brought to tears by the video mm. because I thought to myself, this young lady understood what Vatican II was trying to say. And if we can get them to do that, now I, I hope we haven't lost um, institution as a whole with the new generation, because there was something about the institution. If we could make them understand that what we're doing here tonight, we're all, this is our institution. We are the institution. We are the church. And it doesn't have to be headed, you know, we're not headed by a local bishop who's, you know, starting with the prayer and ending, you know, we're, we're having a lay woman who's starting it and a nun who's giving a talk and we're all praying. It's, it's, this is the church. If they could understand that this is what church really was envisioned by Vatican II, we may be able to bring them back to member membership to to understand that this is because we need community if we learned anything about the pandemic we learned that we cannot we were not meant to live alone we were meant to live with each other in some shape or form and um uh, uh when i spoke with the sisters of saint joseph i 
I shared a, a quote with them, a reflection that was sent out to my congregation by one of our sisters last uh, year, but it was called, What If 2020 Wasn't Canceled? And I will bring it next week and just share four lines of it with you because it, you know, it says it was a year so raw, so painful. It screamed out loud. You know, this is something that young people would understand. So Marianne, yeah, I, um, I'm so delighted that another class is being taught on Vatican II that pleases me more than I can tell you more. But we will, we will convert them. Great. We will do it. Thank you so much.